8.30. This was our first day as a church. Nine months. Is anybody excited about that? I mean, nine months. Like, praise God about what he's doing here. And um, it's, it's, it's a fun time to be on staff here. It's a busy time to be on staff here. Um, all of our departments are going crazy, keeping everything in order, like announcements and, um, and, uh, and uh, graphics and everything else. When I say departments, I mean uh, Pastor Adam and myself. And so, um, so thank you uh, for, your, for your grace um, when we are overwhelmed, but also thank you for coming and being a part of what, what God's doing. There's nothing we'd rather do than be here in this place with you all, be in this city, um, doing something significant, um, running in the lanes God has called us each to run. And so thank you uh, for locking hours with us, those of you who have. And for those of you who haven't, or maybe here for the first time, welcome, welcome to Aletheia. We're so glad you're here. Let me tell you a little bit about our, ch- about our church. This, this church, as young as it is, has a very ancient um, goal and mission. It's simply to bring the truth, grace, and changing power of the gospel for the glory of God and the good and the joy of everyone that we would come into contact with. And so that, 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 that truth and that grace that God would uh, just give us, that the, the, we, would, we would extend it. We would love our community and we would see God's glory happen. So we believe that when we come into contact with God, we change. God changes our lives and so we cannot but bless those around us. And so, so that is our prayer, is that we, as we move forward, as this church grows, we would continue to be a blessing through events like fall family festivals and Christmas Eve services and crazy Easter egg hunts and all kinds of stuff that maybe not just, you know, you know, scratches your itch, but will bless our community as well. So that's why we do stuff like that. And if you all show up tonight, holy cow, the bouncy house is going to explode. But, um, but for those of you who can, again, I'll put a plug in there. We'd love to have a couple extra volunteers. So uh, we're, we're in the middle of the book of Galatians. If you would, go ahead and turn there. You could turn to the book of Galatians. Chapter, f- I mean, uh, yeah, chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. And we're going to have a great time together. Um, let me turn there as well. I, my marker fell out. Galatians chapter 4. See, we pick up here, we've been walking systematically through the, through the book of Galatians, verse by verse, really diving into what this book would say. And it's, uh, it's kind of a big deal, kind of a big deal. Paul is speaking here to, to a group of churches or congregations in the, the region of Galatia, ch- churches that he helped plant himself. And so what he's done is he's gone away, turned it over to local leadership. These churches have grown, but false teaching has come in. This is important for us today to remember that, 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 that while even as young as we are, we have to hold to the truth that God would set forth in his word of who ultimately he is. And so what, what's, what's happened, and I'm not going to belabor this point for those of you who've been coming, it's over and over again, that, that these, these false teachers have come and, and have kind of hijacked the gospel that I mentioned earlier. This good news of a God who is more holy and awesome and amazing than we could ever imagine looked upon us and our broken condition, all of our jacked up lives with compassion, and did something about it so that we might be reconciled to him. That's the gospel. Whenever we use that Christian lingo, this is what we mean. That Christ, he who knew no sin, became sin for us. He paid the price for us so that we might get and know God. It's an amazing thing this morning, and it should excite you this morning. And so today, where we pick up Paul here, is being, from the beginning, he's been hammering these Galatian Christians. What are you doing? Wake up. Where have you gone? You're going off the reservation. This is not Christianity, what you're diving into. He says it's not about what you can do. It's not about the things you add. It's not Jesus plus. It's not simply acknowledging that God's real and doing your own thing and hoping he'll bless it. It's not simply saying... Saying, Jesus, yes, saves you, and then now you've got to fulfill all these other requirements to really know God, to really be a good Christian. It's simply Christ and Christ alone. Paul's hammering this point over and over again, and we've been hammering it at you in different ways every week for the past few weeks. But today, we pick up at a crucial point, and so I'm so excited to share with you. Today, Paul begins to transition his tone. He begins to take it from a place of, of this, this, this theoretical our tight argument for justification, when I say justification, being reconciled to God through Christ alone, and begins to change it and say, no, but here's what you get. 
today we're going to be talking about a little sneak peek in this Christian doctrine called adoption. Adoption. Everything we talk about today is going to be under this heading. So if you can with me, just, just start thinking this way. Pick it up in Scripture. Notice Paul's language here, adoption. You see, we are redeemed through Christ's work. And last week we found out that we were heirs according to his promise. But there's something even more, something that Paul would say today that I think is going to hopefully do wonders in your life if you haven't yet grasped a hold of it. Let's actually back up slightly. Chapter 3, we'll start in verse 28. It won't be on the screens, but you can catch up in just a moment. Here we go. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also... When we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly. When you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a body ailment that I... Preach the gospel to you at first, and though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but receive me as an angel of God as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose, speaking of the false teachers. They make not much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of. For a good purpose. And not only when I'm present with you, my little children. Sorry. Yes. And not only when I'm present with you, for, uh, my little children, for whom I am in again, again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone for I'm perplexed about you. I'm going to pray and ask that God would speak to us today. He would open our hearts and he would have his way. So God, we, we do, we ask you by your Holy Spirit to be here. We thank you the promise of your Holy Spirit, as we even read, God, invade our hearts. God, speak truth to us. God, I pray that you would anoint me to preach. God, that you, your word would go forth in power, that all of our lives would be changed, that we be more like Jesus, that Christ would be formed in us today. God, we just want to know you. Help us today. Amen. I got a quote for you. J.I. Packer, um, who's a Christian theologian, said this. And this is where we're going to be our starting off point. You sum up the whole, this is not going to be on the, Christian, I mean on the screen, so you have to listen to me. Uh, you sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. But this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life. It means that he does not understand Christianity. For everything that Christ taught, everything that is instinctively Christian, is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. I believe what Paul is arguing here is that, is that as we add requirements, as the Judaizers were doing, they were coming and saying, no, to be a true Christian, you not only have to follow, accept, repent of your sin, um, you know, worship Jesus, but you have to follow all these Jewish customs, all these laws. And what he was saying is, is that simply um, when, you, when, you, when you add that, when you add requirements to come into God, when, you, when Jesus' sacrifice, his death for you isn't sufficient, you miss out on one of the most amazing aspects, or I would argue the most amazing aspect of Christianity, namely that God is our Father. You miss it. 
We miss it. It's hard for us to understand in our culture. It's hard, this idea of God as a father. It really is. Many of us statistically probably didn't have much dads growing up. Many of us. We, we, we all have, you know, we don't have perfect dads for those of us who have them, who've been around the whole time. Um, and and we, we, like to, we like to kind of superimpose this idea of fatherhood and what we experienced growing up onto God. And many of us kind of run from God for that. It was like, if, if God is a father, then I want nothing to do with that. No, I'd rather have a God who, who stands up there playing duck, duck, damn, or who stands up there and says, you know, do X, Y, and Z, and I'll be happy. And I can fit that mold. I can do that thing. But the idea of a good, perfect, and loving father, sometimes we don't have a slot in our brains for that because we've never even experienced it in the first place. Uh, John Eldridge, he's a, he's a Christian author, um, wrote a book about being a man, and like some of it, didn't like some other parts of it, but, but basically what, what, what I did grasp a hold of, he's talking about this wound that we all have from our fathers, that all of our fathers are imperfect, earthly fathers, and so there's a wound that they cause that only they can cause, but only our true father in heaven can heal. He kind of explores that in some of his books, and um, it's kind of interesting. You know, my, my dad growing up, I'm not going to throw my dad under the bus for all of you, sound like some kind of soap opera. My dad is uh, still married to my mom. Uh, he, he worked a ton, provided for my family, um, still loves my family, my kids. Talking about driving up here for Thanksgiving. He's insane. He lives in Florida, um, driving. And, um, I mean, yesterday, are you kidding me? Drive up here. And, um, but, uh, but even then, there, there, I have you know, slight issues. Like with my dad, things like, oh, I can't believe you did that. We've worked through them over the years. It's great. But there's still wounds that, that happen the same is true in your life. There, there's things, where, there's times where, 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 where our earth fathers just, just didn't cut it. The scary thing for me is that I'm a dad. I have three little girls and a boy on the way. There's going to be areas, they're gorgeous. I love my little girls. Um, and my strapping young lad, uh, we're kind of arguing over the name. I kind of like Lemuel, but my wife doesn't. Um, sorry, that's cathartic. Um, but, uh, but, but the scary thing as a dad is you know that you're going to do something wrong with your kids. Our parents, those of you who are parents know this. You're going to screw up somehow. See, we pray for the grace of God to overcome all of our mistakes and that our kids would love him and know him anyway. Scary. But what does scripture say about this? Let's dive right back in real fast and read, read a couple things. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1 again. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by the father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Slave here, don't read slave like American slavery, read more like bond servant. Like somebody, like, that, like slavery was in the, in the, in, to the, the group that he was talking. It's not somebody who was bought and sold or completely owned, but somebody who was trying to work off a debt. Somebody who, was, who, who had to do what they were told if they wanted to receive, you know, kind of the blessing that they were being promised. Um, in here, he's, he's comparing heirs, young children who, who are the heirs of, of their parents to, to simply, they, they still have to obey. There's not freedom. They're, they're kind of in bondage to do the work that re, they're required to do. And he's saying that that's, that's, that, that's, that's okay, but that's not the freedom that God would have you come into. You see, and he's re referencing the, the traditions, the religious traditions that the Galatians were coming out of. Both of those who may have been pagan um, or those who, were, who, who came out of a Jewish tradition in which simply uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's and checking the boxes was the way that we got the favor of God. He's saying there's more than that. As it, is, is much as it messes with the gospel, what it does to your soul is even worse. He's saying there's more goes on to say this, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Saying that simply when the time came, when the perfect time had come, God sent his very own son, Jesus Christ, to step into the course of human history, draw us into relationship with him, to redeem us, to pull us out from under the weight of doing everything perfectly and understanding that there's grace there's unmerited favor of God upon our lives. That yes, we want to work hard, we want to be excellent, and we want to give glory to God with our lives. But it is not a requirement to approach him or a requirement to know him. It is the fuel that 
spurs us on to do great things. And it's important for us to know that God's purpose wasn't simply to redeem you. Christians, those who are looking into Christianity, it isn't just a get out of hell free card. This whole idea of Christ dying, it was to bring us into the family of God. Family. You see it? You're no longer a slave. The idea of of doing everything perfectly no longer should hold you back or hold you down. You see, many times what we've done is, uh, we live in Boston. We live in specifically, this church is in Cambridge. And so this place, we love, we're achievers. We love to do everything correctly. We're the best. We work hard for what we get. We deserve it too. And so we like to take our lives and our drive and our personal experience and we superimpose that upon our faith and we approach God and we say, God, look what I did for you. Look at my report card. You know, like I got 10 bucks in A growing up. What are you going to do now that I'm in, you know, university? What's going on? Like, yes, you should give me a great job, God. Like, we, we think that, that our earthly actions and what we do should automatically just kind of, you know, twist God's arm behind his back and say, love me more, God, love me more. Pour it out, give me what I want. Like some kind of, you know, weird relationship with a codependent parent or something like that. It doesn't work that way. You see, God loves us already. In fact, I want to um, go there for a minute. Let's, let's, let's skip on ahead. There's... We're going to go to Matthew. i got to jump in my notes a little bit. Matthew, chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me. We're going to read something. We're going to read about Jesus. We're going to read about what God said to, to his first son, Jesus. Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do do you come to... But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You see, when you kind of look at the life and the trajectory of Jesus' life, you'll realize that this moment, this moment in history where the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus and God affirms him and gives him identity and says, listen, you are my son, this is my son, I am pleased with him. It's before he did anything in ministry. Everything else comes after. All the crazy miracles, dying, raising from the dead, all that awesome stuff that he did that we look at that was purpose for our redemption. God spoke in a moment, and yet we have nothing recorded of of major significance that he did. Now, Jesus, of course, being perfect, pretty awesome in that, and not having any sin in his life. I can't quite relate, but yet God, before he'd accomplished the task that was set before him by the Father, before he'd accomplished any of it, God said, this is my son and I love him. The same is true for us. Why do I love my kids? You know why I love my kids? Because they're mine. Sometimes they're knuckleheads, like, sometimes they're crazy. Elise yesterday, jumping on my head in my bed saying, it's my birthday, it's my birthday. We told her it was yesterday so we could have a party. It's my birthday, like jumping on my head. I'm like, I'm so tired. Like, I don't, okay, happy birthday. You know, and she's like singing to herself, happy birthday, on my head at 7 a.m. And yes, it's cute, but I wake up hard. Like, I do, I really do. And, um, but I love my kids because they're my kids. I helped create them. How ridiculous would it be if I said, hey, I love you. Now do all these things so I'll be happy with you. And you better get into a good school and get scholarships. I'm not paying for it. I'm not paying for it. Like my parents didn't pay for me. I'm not paying for you. Like, like how ridiculous would that be? Jesus had not even begun his ministry and yet God speaks 
And we have the temptation, I believe, to think that we could somehow lose the love or the affection of God our Father on our lives. Somehow, like if we don't measure up, if we're not good enough, or we don't get in the right degree program, or we don't have the right job, we don't have the perfect kids, somehow we can work our way out of the love and the affection of God. Do you remember like the most famous verse in Christianity? John 3, 16, the one that says, For God so loved the world that he would give his son for us. That he would love us enough that he would even sacrifice his own son to bring us in a relationship with him. The son that he loved. Blows my mind. And see, this is the gospel that Paul was preaching. This is what he was speaking to these churches when he founded them. He's saying, wake up. There's a God who loves you, who desires to have a relationship with you so much that he sent his son. This good news, there's a way back to God, and he's your father, and he loves you dearly. The temptation is always, even if you come to God under that understanding, to go back and try to earn it. The scary thing is, is that the ways you try to earn it, the ways, the things that you devote your life to to find significance, whether it's doing all the rules, whether it's following all the rules, whether it's, it's working the hardest at work, whether it's success, money, whatever else, even when you try to stamp God on those things, those turn into false idols and they are, make horrible gods. And Paul, Paul can smell it. We do this. We work hard. We put in long hours at work. Let's read verse 12 through 20 together in Galatians, if you still have it. Here we go. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. Paul's saying, basically, he, he, he left his, his Jewish tradition, his, the rules, so that we become like these Galatians, because there's freedom in worshiping Christ. And he's like, no, 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 come, become like I, I have become. I became like you, free to worship God outside of these rules and rigid rules. And he says, but now that you have come to know God, or rather, sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. Uh, Brother, I entreat you to become as I am, for I have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a body ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, hey, I kind of feel, some. though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn to despise me, but receive me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus what then has become of your, your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. Paul's saying, remember what happened? Remember what I told you? Remember how you received it? And yet you were so excited that there was freedom and love. And God would reconcile himself to you that you were just, that we, we were on the same page. You loved me so much. And then he goes on to say, have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? By reminding you that simply faith By grace, through faith alone, you can access the God of the universe, the one who loves you enough to adopt you as his kids. We see why. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out so that you may may make, may make much of them. We love you. We will encourage you to pieces around here. But if you ever get the idea... If you're ever in a place, friends, or in a church where people are making much of you simply so you'll do what they say, run far away. But if people are making much of you to spur you on to the good things that God has called you to do, grab hold of those relationships for they will help you go far. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, not only when I am present with you, my little children. For whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed with you. This is strong language. And it's very true. Paul is in anguish that Christ, the Spirit of Christ, the Son of God, would be formed in these people. You see, it's not simply that you would be justified or reconciled to God or that you would.